Um, so today we're going to be talking about talent in the 21st century. Um, and we've got a really good group here of university leaders, um, industry people, and some experts in uh, learning acquisition. So the first question I'm going to put to the group is um, really from an industry perspective. And the question is, are universities falling short in their duty to provide industries like IBM, Microsoft, Google with the employees that they need? My name is Karen Ray from IBM Research. And um, so what we are thinking about is if there is a possibility to get people sooner um, joining the workforce. And uh, it might be a possibility to have them um, having a degree that is pre-bachelor. We have a program in the U.S., where we tried this out. We started it in 2011. It's called P-TECH. Um, and um, then you can really have your degree, um, an academic degree, but also an associated degree that allows you really to go into the workforce in IT or in healthcare. And um, yes, in principle, to have a more flexible, more modular system. Uh, that's the thinking uh, we have right now. And the question is, how do you react uh, from the university side to that? So we've got, starting earlier, this sounds like it's, it's fundamentally changing the way higher education works and, and a lot more influence from universities or from industry into to universities and how they're preparing students. Um, any rebuttal to that? I'm looking at you, Ralph, from Microsoft, if you've got a similar opinion. I think for us it's maybe very pointed if you look at the changes from a technology perspective. The drivers we see is a guy is very heavy right now on AI. The driver we see is very he heavy on, on data research, skills, and capacity. So I think I would start in saying we have jointly an issue. The data would tell that we're looking for 800 million jobs to be reskilled globally based on technology. The latest study we did in Asia is 35% of jobs will be changed in companies. So there's a, a bigger issue I think we have, which is the whole reskilling. And, and resetting direction. Now, I would say AI and uh, data research capacity is still at, at early stages from a pure volume and from a pure kind of framing the need and framing the skill. So there is a need jointly with the research institutions to find out how we lay a path on the research side and bring them into industry and maybe have a joint effort on that one. I think that's where we're really short right now. All CEOs I'm speaking are desperately looking, so we're right now hunting for best resources. So, so that's very pointed, uh, the gap we see right now. And it's not for me a blaming, it's a joint effort we need to do with research uh, facilities and community. I'd like to shift the perspective on this question just a little bit in two ways. One is that the pressure that we get from Silicon Valley is for more PhDs in computer science and AI. It's not so much that they're pressuring us for more undergraduates um, trained to go into the workforce. In fact, they hire many, many of our undergraduates. But it, it seems to me this poses a really interesting question about the relationship of the university to this demand for... Um, more students trained in computer science, AI, because we're, we're a repository for all knowledge, and I worry sometimes about the distorting effect of, um, of great um, pressure uh, from, I'll just use Silicon Valley as a kind of, of symbolic um, name for the, the industry writ large for certain disciplines to the sacrifice of others. Um, 800 million jobs, so Switzerland is not going to solve that issue, but uh, we will certainly contribute. And something that we are doing at ETH already since many years is to ask our students to spend one semester uh, into the industry. And I have myself a son studying uh, computer science and he did that. And I think it's very important because it gives a, a ties already to, to the Indians, not only the big ones, you know, big and small industry. There is another point that I want to mention. Yes, we need to produce more PhD students in that field, but we shouldn't forget also um, the, the apprenticeships. And that's something in Switzerland, it's very strong. I know it's not the case in US and in other countries. And uh, so we are putting an effort also on this in Switzerland. So to have all the chains. 
Suzanne Fortier from McGill University. In Canada, we used to hear that all the time from the industry. Your students are not ready. And so, and we used to say, well, they may not be ready exactly for tomorrow, but they have to be ready for the long term. And so that's always the problem. And so we stop uh, having this conversation and started doing something about it. And we have a big project of having every student in Canada have a work integrated learning experience. This is a joint project between the private sector and the universities and colleges. So I think that's a positive thing for us. Let's stop <laughs> telling each other that we're not doing the right thing and let's start doing something together that is good for the students, not only for tomorrow, but for the longer term. What I'm hearing is not so much that we should stop what we're doing. What I'm hearing is that we, industry is saying we demand more. Because I think, I think we should be careful not to get universities to... Um, uh, be just utilitar utilitarian, just give skills that you're going to use now. But what I'm hearing is that um, we need more we, um, uh, kind of programs at undergraduate level, the demands are more. I think that's a better conversation to have. It doesn't say what we're doing uh, is totally wrong, throw it away, there will not be need for PhDs. I think there'll still be need for PhDs, but I think what I'm hearing is that we need more that's different. And perhaps... Um, this is a point where we say, can we work with industry to see what it is? That's not to say industry is going to tell us everything that we should be doing. It can be one co collaborative thing with industry about what we're doing, because I think what we're doing, um, in fact, the complexities that we're having with, with um, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, or AI or machine, uh, human machines, is, comes from us. I mean, we, we create the knowledge, we create... Um, the, the in, we are innovative, creative thinking is what we do. Um, uh, so it's not as if industries bring introducing something new to us. It's the knowledge that we've created. It just so happens now that it's been reappropriated. And we are being asked as if we don't know it. But we do. Okay? So the question is, can you produce more? And maybe we should talk about what that more is. It's not necessarily to throw away what we're doing already. Thank you. I'm Ferdinand Hamblopper from the University of Waterloo. Uh, I think there are three components to this question, so as to the uh, answer. One is industry's immediate needs, either coders, programmers, and for that, they really don't care whether the students will have a bachelor's degree or even a university degree. The midterm need is undergraduates, but different from a traditional definition of undergraduates. They have to have the knowledge, but they have to have creativity, imagination, communication skills, teamwork, all of those. And the long term is like the PhDs. Uh, so to disrupt whatever is happening today, something that you don't know what may happen, but you for that, you need much deeper knowledge. Let's face it, before we were talking about AI, deep learning was what was happening at the university conversations. So at the University of Waterloo, what we've been doing, we have a co-op system. So that industry-university relationship happens five times in a student's, undergraduate student's lifetime at the university. It's not only the work experience of a student, but imagine five times tremendous knowledge coming back and forth. So with 6,700 employers we have who hire our 21,000 students, we also have great research relationship with them. So it is what we see as what we're going to, of course, this is not what we're, where we want to stay. It's going to evolve. But this is how we define, we have been defining and will continue defining talent and to satisfy the need of industry. Okay. Just two quick points. One is that uh, you should consider that question against the backdrop of uh, massification of higher education. Right? Uh, just take the Asia example and take Singapore. Uh, NUS, 40 years ago, uh, we admitted only a quarter of what I'm admitting now. So in 40 years, we have quadrupled our admission. So uh, uh, in many countries, it's much, much more. All right? And that quality control, when you in inject more universities, can create that sort of uh, impression uh, amongst employers. Second thing is just to build on uh, uh, our experience. We learn a lot from Waterloo in terms of engagement with uh, companies. And uh, uh, going forward, uh, we think that we have to work even closer with companies. So recently, for instance, we introduced free degree programs, data analytics, 
uh, business analytics and uh, cybersecurity. And in these three programs, degree programs, uh, we have incorporated a one and a half years of internship with a company over that four years. We, we learn from the co-op program, but we try to build it again within that four years uh, framework. So I think that's what some of the things that we can do to make sure that our graduates are more industry ready. Farid, and I thought you put it in, in a good framework there, looking at kind of the immediate needs undergraduates and then the longer term PhDs. And that's something that comes up a lot when we're talking about this is these soft skills, creativity, problem solving, critical thinking. Um, Sarah, I'm going to go to you and, and ask you how you think universities can go about measuring that. Well, I, of course, THA always want to measure everything. And you know that I'm going to say you can't measure quality. But anyway, um, we, we've just, we're just starting a project at the moment on a, a talent um, development project in which we understand that industry says students come to us and their soft skills aren't as developed as they could be. We don't want to take away from the, 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 the really important um, work we're doing in the, in the lessons, in the curricula, and so on. But there is a lot of capturing of extra soft skill development that can be done that is already embedded in all of the work we do with the, the projects when the students do leadership and so on. So we're looking at how we can do that. We've, we've created a sort of a, a grid of what the various competences are, and uh, my president is going to see that in the next executive board meeting, um, and we're rolling, we're rolling that out, and again, to try and see how we can help to uh, improve, and our idea is that they will have their uh, formal academic qualifications, and they will also have a record of everything else as well that will be uh, a, 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 you know, a, a record with data and certificates and whatever, uh, and self-assessment and so on, so that when they present that to an employer, you've got the formal academic record and you've got everything else. Um, and I think that would be really exciting uh, and I'm sure that the companies will benefit from that, in the future, as, of course, the students, which is the main uh, focus. So then, did you want to say something to that? No? no? Okay. Uh, Manu, I'm wondering if I could go to you now, our, our expert in, in measuring expertise and, and how expertise is acquired. Do you have anything to add to that? So I'm Manu, I'm a learning scientist. Um, so what I'm, basically if you look back at the research on the science of human learning, you look at knowledge and use in the professional practice and the knowledge that gets taught in the schools and the universities, there's a big disconnect. It, knowledge that is taught in the universities or schools doesn't transfer very well knowledge in professional practice and that's the fundamental lament <clears throat> that industry has from time to time. And one of the reasons why that happens, we know from the basic research, is knowledge is always situated in a practice. So if the schooling practice is not aligned with professional practice, then what you learn in school will not transfer very well. Right? And so whether it's hard, hardcore knowledge, explicit knowledge, or the soft skills, implicit ways of thinking and being, so a basic, solu a basic solution uh, really is to align schooling practices with the disciplinary practices. And I think you will slowly but surely, so when you talk about work school integration or semester at, at a particular company, the more we align these practices within which people learn, the better they will be at acquiring not just the knowledge, but also the skill sets around that. I think one of the challenges, as, and I'm Brian Schmidt from the Australian National University, that we have, and, and I agree, it's very useful, is that uh, most of my students are not engineers of a certain type and know exactly where they're going to land. Uh, there is a small practice, and it's very clear what we do in that case. We get them out there, integrate them in. But my students could end up in a government department, they could end up for a finance firm, they could end up... Uh, you know, anything in between an NGO and the practices there are so vastly different that we have to come up with something that is a bit more generic. Now, it might be that, you know, trying one of them is, some of it's translatable, but it is quite complicated how to create something for that first job, but as the job after the job after the job after. And uh, I don't have a great solution. I like to come up with solutions, and I don't have one on this one. I'm just going to go to it. I should add that uh, universities have um, two very unique uh, challenges. That's called inertia. We have bad inertia and good inertia. Good inertia is who we are, what are we all about, 
And as Brian put it yesterday at another event, we are the curators of knowledge. And that's how we share it, that's how we disseminate it with our students and with greater society. And we want to continue that independent, unbiased thinking, teaching and learning and inquiry for the truth. The bad inertia part is our, our insistence on how we do it, the way we've been doing it and we want to keep doing this. <clears throat> And this is the part we really need to redesign, reinvent how students learn, what it means for them to be in a university in that really independent, free thinking environment, and how do we then move it forward and redefine a university. The university of the future will look different. It will be a networked university, network with the society, network <laughs> with other institutions, network with industry. That's how we really integrate learning at a much broader and deeper scale. And this is what I think in the long term, how we are able to answer all the challenges or fantastic opportunities, but also exercise our responsibilities at institutions of higher learning. I think fundamentally, the mapping between universities training and uh, the professional demand can never be really made very well because you look at the discipline in the university and the, the very fast development of the professional field, it just cannot be done that way, okay? The other thing is uh, we certainly need to emphasize the diversity of the learning mode. Look at the e-learning right now, the MOOCs, and uh, certainly it has much, much more noticeably impact on computer science related, in, obviously because A, a lot more jobs requirement, B, it will be more straightforward to teach, okay? So I think we need to really look at the way, based on the type of the discipline we want to instill in the student. Then every university, I'm sure, we are all doing a lot of experiments, okay? Like what uh, NCA has said, we also have been trying to do. Some of them actually will be much more demanding in terms of faculty-student ratio. Some of them can be much more massive. So I think we need to be willing to be more open-minded because the requirements are not the same and the outlook are not the same. Thank you. I think it's a, a limiting and almost even dangerous um, a point of view to say that the university should only be about professional training. And um, there's a wonderful essay, we're now quite old, about 20 years old, by the great chemist Thomas Cech, in which he has noticed over the years that many of the most important scientific leaders in the United States, uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, heads of great scientific institutions, had liberal arts education and even didn't major in the sciences. And he, he, he questions why that's the case, and he says, that um, studying the liberal arts is important, not just because you get scientists who like the opera and like to read books, but um, rather um, you get scientists who are able to change their frame of reference um, quite dramatically and therefore be particularly creative in their um, posing of solutions. So I think it's, it, it's just such a danger to think that we should be tailoring our education just to provide professional preparation for particular industries. Thanks. I would like to come back to your point that the universities are the place where um, knowledge is curated and also to your point uh, that is changing your frame of reference. And um, for the industry, the question is how can we benefit um, in, in the context of lifelong learning from really these qualities? And is there a possibility that in the future there are no alumni anymore, but that there are learning partners, that when you graduate from a university, then you will not um, be just an alumni, but you will stay a learning partner in a learning community for your whole life, and that the university is yeah, proactively providing you guidance uh, for your personal development. So, just a couple of points. One is the domain specificity of some of these skills. Uh, there's been a big debate historically whether things like creativity, inventiveness, critical thinking, are these domain general things? So once you're a creative person in one domain, can you extend it to the other domains? 
um, and for similar for other things. Uh, and we're finding increasingly evidence falls in favor of domain specificity. So you can be, you don't learn creativity outside of learning mathematics, you learn creativity while learning mathematics, right? So that poses an interesting challenge for university preparation, especially if we are preparing students to learn new things all the time. How do we build creativity, inventiveness, critical thinking into? And there are ways of doing that, we can do that. But to think that we can do it outside of knowledge acquisition and skills acquisition is a danger. The second point I would make is about professional practice again. If you look at knowledge in use in the profession and knowledge in the domain, take for example medical doctors, medicine. If you look at what doctors actually use in their professional practice versus what doctors actually need to learn, is a huge difference. Mm. Right? So we need, in higher education especially, we need to rethink how we think about knowledge. Because knowledge divorced from the doing or the use of that knowledge in practice is dangerous. And I think once we start to think that, oh, um, what's the minimum set, minimal set of knowledge we need students to have so that they can engage in professional practice while at the same time being more interdisciplinary, going into the liberal arts, I think there will be time in the curriculum to do that. I just want to follow up with Manu's point that uh, very often uh, uh, typical university education or teaching and learning is actually the professor conveying all right, the knowledge and <coughs> students try to assimilate the thinking behind it. The professor may have facilitated it by explaining the thinking, but uh, uh, I think this is useful for perhaps a very good rank of students, but when you talk about you know, a bigger spectrum of abilities of students, then it becomes more challenging. <laughs> so it's just how do we actually better engage the students in their teaching and learning? And uh, my point of view is that I think there has to be a lot of experiential learning. I think that is the most powerful. We will be coming to Singapore and working with your students and TUM and MIT with an ETHA uh, Singapore month. Um, and that's all about design thinking, solving problems of science, technology, and policy, giving the students a cultural awareness of uh, going to, to, to Asia. And I think these sort of opportunities, we started with an ATR week. Uh, it's huge uh, fun to work multidisciplinary across a really a major uh, problem of concern, energy, for example, water, food, or whatever. So I think that's a really great option. And then what's fascinating is the students who were there the year before are trained to become the tutors and the coaches of the next generation. They interact. Simona, you were involved with, with one of these. It was really, really, really marvellous. So second thing I wanted to say to Karen's point, um, I think the relationship with the university is going to be much more a lifelong thing, as you say. We're really ramping up our, our continuing education. We've just announced this week a, co a course uh, on applied technology where people who've gone into business as business people now can learn, come into a Master of Advanced uh, Studies and learn about where various technologies <coughs> so that they have the opportunity then to go up further in the organization because they now have an understanding of the technology that they didn't get before. So, as Carol said, with a liberal arts education, then going on to business, then bringing the technology in um, at a later stage. And I think this is going to be a really a very exciting course, and I'm looking forward to it. Great. That, that takes me to my next um, provocative question. Is university wasted on the young? <laughs> So uh, Singapore, in its amazingly organized fashion, brings people from around the world. And one of the things they're thinking about is they educationally plan each stage literally like you're talking about as a system, a, a closed system. So it's quite remarkable. But one of the questions I ask is the following, is can you learn those fundamental basic skills of creativity where you have to go in and do things for 10,000 hours again and again and again? And my uh, I mean, it's not absolute, but my life experience is people are much better at doing that stuff when they're 18 than when they're 44. <laughs> and that sets a platform for what you are able to do and how you're able to be trained as opposed to educated. So education is sort of wasted on the young, but it's not because it is not clear at least with our current societal constraints, that you can do that later in life. Life gets too busy, you lose focus, and you end up in a hole that cannot be overcome. I think the university fundamentally is a 
social gathering place for, for, for human beings. Yeah. So we should never take that away. Many young people don't know what they want to do. Okay? So I think for what I just mentioned in terms of liberal art, we certainly, I feel that's a very important principle to uphold. On the other hand, not every student wants that. We also know that. We, cannot, we shouldn't force everybody to go through that either. So many students have far more pragmatic and also first-hand video, playing, video game playing mindset. That's how they learn. And we cannot just say, you must learn mathematics from calculus and all the way up. That will not work. Okay, so we have to come to them so to let them see certain first-hand experience, but also maintaining the other rigor and depth. So this is really a very complicated matter, and it cannot be done just by scaling up with any single formula. We have to maintain originality and pragmatic approach. Yeah, I want to approach this from a slightly different angle. Um, one, other, one thing that we didn't touch on was not our, our graduates, our students who will fulfill the needs of broader society or uh, industry specifically, but there is this new thing, startup culture, entrepreneurship emerging from our institutions, and it's significant in terms of its size and magnitude. Uh, what we have observed is really unique that initially they really, they don't really care. Once they have it going, we had a challenge of many students dropping out of their programs. Hey, I don't need this from this point onward. I've made it. Later on, once they cross that death of valley and say, hey, this is really serious now, mm. they do a number of things. One is they establish multidisciplinary teams. Mm. And in that team, you will be amazed to see how much they want people at PhD level and PhD in philosophy, arts, liberal arts, they want. Second thing, after a while, they come back and say, I made a grave error, I want to complete my degree. So there is that you know, transformation happening, but it is a significant message to us, again, to go back to establish that continuity that their learning is lifelong. And there may be some interruptions at one point. That doesn't mean that their time is wasted at a university. It takes a different shape. Um, I think in the context of the question, uh, it's not so much is it wasted, but it's that the environment has been changing very quickly, right? And uh, the current techniques that we are using, the current framework, does not seem to be able to respond to those changes. Um, Singapore, we are doing a big experiment. And the backdrop of this is really how to make the Singapore economy more competitive. And one key part of it is really human capital. And the skilling and reskilling of uh, workers in Singapore, I think, is very key. Uh, one important point in this is that uh, you have the government, you have the industry, you have the educational institutes from primary school, secondary school, polytechnics to universities. Uh, what part of the plans of the government is actually to pull the government, the industry, and the educational institutions together to work together to address the issue. And I think that's the key trust. I just think there's a, there's a, a, real, a real concern about the, the policy environment we're working in as well, in the sense that in so many countries, and I think acutely in, in the United Kingdom at the moment, the policy mechanisms are almost forcing a utilitarianism in terms of valuing a degree in terms of a short-term financial outcome for the individual. It's seen as a private gain. It's seen as a, um, you know, we're measuring success and rewarding uh, universities for producing highly salaried graduates and I think it forces the student to see themselves as a consumer looking to the short term. It forces society to look at universities purely in terms of getting people that first job, completely ignoring these much more fundamental challenges that we're not training people for their first job, we're educating them for all the multiple jobs they'll have across a career and I do think that we're increasingly certainly in some countries, I think Australia, US, Britain, being sort of pushed into this very utilitarian view of what universities are, and it's bad for the wider economic needs. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to um, the point, so I fully agree universities are curating the knowledge, but what I 
uh, recently also experienced um, in teaching the students, I feel we need to think about also educating them how to educate themselves. Um, because knowledge is not only anymore filtered, I mean, we, we filter and curate at universities, but students and society are exposed to, um, to, to global knowledge in a way where it's getting more and more difficult to actually um, identify what, what is right and what not, and the critical thinking behind that, what is a trustworthy source, um, and, and, such, um, and, and how can I actually, um, given a problem, how can I uh, find the right answer to it, and which are the paths, and this is, um, I think we can teach them best by uh, giving them problems to do that. And, and Sarah, you mentioned these examples of um, ETH week where, where we have a full week of, of doing that. But I feel this becomes more and more important. And this goes along with the lifelong learning because these tools, so I think we should start not even at university much earlier, actually. How do I not just look up uh, something on, uh, yeah, Google, Google it, but what does that mean? There's a lot of bias in how we ask questions and, um, and, and yeah, kind of going into this. Can I say, I mean, I, I, I'm surprised that we, this, there seems to be a sense that some of these things we're not doing already. I mean, I, 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 I don't, certainly where in the university that I work in, and I've worked in, this is the third university, I understand that university education, first of all, teaches you how to learn. Um, so, so the content is not, it's not just about the content, it's, it's about much more. But, but I think there's also innovations at our, at our university. For example, a professor who's teaching biomedical engineering who the students spend the semester and there's no, there is not, no, not necessarily just teaching. They get a project at the beginning of the semester. They work on it throughout the semester and they submit at the end with consultations throughout. I mean, there's different models. So I, and I think I was, I was encouraged when we, we had a, a Gulf meeting this week that... I think we, I don't want us to be shaken. I think, I think we, we shouldn't be shaken as if um, the rapid changes that are happening now are introducing something completely different mm. that we don't know. Certainly, it's, there's going to be a requirement for us to do some things differently and some new things. But a lot of what it is, we're doing already. Maybe we're not foregrounding it enough. Maybe we're not being explicit about the fact that we're doing it. And maybe the... The, 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 you know, we have to do more of other things. So I, I sit here and, I, and I'm thinking, of course, in a developing context, we, they, 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 we've been pushed to be, to, you know, to produce students for jobs or whatever. The student model has been with us for a long time and the big issue is that it's, it's finances. But, but, but we've got to push back against that. And, and, and how do we do that, becoming more explicit about... What is it that we do? What's the value of what we're doing? And someone said, thinking about what if we were not there to do it? I mean, there has to be a realization that if, as you, if, if universities were more utilitarian, in fact, we may not even be talking about AI. Actually. So, so we are here simply because we're not utilitarian, the, because we're critical thinkers, because innovation is our thing. That's mm. why we are here, and that's why the changes that you see, it's not that they introduced completely by, by, by industry. They, they come from us and sometimes in collaboration with industry. So we're not, you know, we shouldn't, yeah, I don't think we should position ourselves as if we, we've been given a script and then we must produce something to match the script. Great, thanks. Another question that I have, though, is if we're talking about the, this life of learning and this life um, relationship with universities, um, Talent might be universal, but opportunities are not. So how do we ensure that, that we're getting to the talent that will actually be useful for economic growth and for innovation? How, how, do, how do we make sure that we're getting to the students that actually need this, this training that we're talking about? It's a multifaceted question because it starts at in, you know, when kids are three years old. Uh, because the opportunity is set then, and it's set by typically in almost all of our economies here by the family income and the education mm -hmm. of that family. So you need to level the playing field as best you can, uh, because if you don't get it right then, it's, it's almost irrecoverable later on. You can keep on picking away at it. Uh, in our case, I am changing the way I'm admitting students this year, uh, where we're going out, and you know, in Australia we have a nationwide test score, not dissimilar to, you know, you, you get a mark, and most of us have some version of this. 
uh, which is a scaling. Uh, and if you look at that, scale, that, that mark, it scales incredibly tightly with socioeconomic opportunity. And when I go through and then I regress out people's ATARs, in our case, this mark, percentage mark, and I then add the variable socioeconomic opportunity, I get this remarkable thing, is that poor kids with lower marks actually outperform rich kids with better marks. Mm. So that informs my admission process because I want to get the talent, the people are going to really do well, and it's telling me that mark is not fit for perfect, and I'm going to go through and use some more information uh, to try to get a, a better cohort that's more representative and so that's what we're doing next year. It's an interesting experiment, uh, experiment and uh, slightly controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, it's you know, the way we're going to do it. And what one would say within the elites of the United States uh, who have you know, complex uh, admissions process, which I would say are not completely transparent, uh, they, they say that's what mm. they're doing. Uh, they are, at, to some point, we think, but there's court cases right now about some of the ramifications of it. It's not transparent. We're going to do it in as, as transparent ways as we can. I'll give you an example. In Switzerland, we have a, a challenge. Only about roughly 20% go to the gymnasium. And this is, of course, selected out at 12 to 14 uh, years of, of age. And a lot of it, you only get to go to the gymnasium if you have the back office at home with the parents who support you, who've already studied, and all the rest of it. So this is a little bit of a challenge. I think one of the ways is naturally the Swiss system of the permeability through going through the apprenticeship and then coming through later on. And if you do the Berufsmatura and then you go to Fachhochschule, you then come on to university if you're at the top level and so on. But not so many people do that. One of the things I think we really should do, and especially this is good at in encouraging young girls to get into STEM subjects, mint subjects, is um, at the ages of 8 to 10, you teach them how to program. And this happens in what's called the Volksschule, and if they develop a passion and a real drive at that age to say, oh, I really want to do this, then notwithstanding the family background, um, they will make it up and they will force their way through. Into this is what my president actually did a few years ago. And I think if you can do that, and we've had a program running for the last eight, uh, eight no, 14 years actually, and about 12,000 school kids have been, uh, have been taught 15 lessons of about 40 minutes. So, and and I, I, unfortunately, I haven't got the measurements of how many have come through at the end. But I think that's one clever way of getting around the classroom. And obviously, that's in only in one area. You really want it in lots of different science areas to make a difference. I think we should, again, uh, think of this from a much broader perspective. So universities are not the only sources of the uh, needs or uh, the, the answers are uh, industry specifically looking for. There are community colleges and other places where they could provide the kind of skills or talent uh, is in need of. But as far as, <coughs> excuse me, student-university relationship go, we shouldn't see it as a one-dimensional, just transactional relationship. It can vary, as you mentioned, there is this massification of higher education and each student is free to design his or her own experience at the university. So starting this year, we go through a one week of orientation of our uh, incoming class. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to ask them to understand the United Nations development goals and also the top 10 risks that WEF uh, listed. Just understand the world a little better. Some of them will connect every single thing that learner, they learn to those because they consider themselves as global citizens while we have our local responsibilities for economic development and everything, but they will see their role there. Some of them, they will see themselves as relationship, very transactional. I'm here, I'm paying for my education, this is what I want to get, this is what I want to do. So it's very difficult to put all of them into one single box. Mm -hmm. There will be a variety of them. Our responsibility is to provide them with an environment that they could really maximize their potential in whichever direction they want to go. So I think the question of talent and opportunity is significant. One way to think about talent is, oh, Sarah is talented or Simone is talented in something. Talent is an individual property. Another way to think about talent is an interaction between the individual and the context within which the individual is. Right? So then talent becomes an interactional attribute. So we are not designers of smart people, we're designers of smart contexts. Right? And that gives us the degrees of freedom to say, no matter what kind of talent or incoming characteristics we have, can we find 
principled, scientifically sound ways of designing smart contexts. And here I would appeal to everybody, there's a history of research in human cognition and learning that tells us specific, principled ways of designing these smart environments, mm -hmm. right? And I understand that design of learning or education is a highly social, politi political, ideological. There's a lot of folksology involved as well in how we think uh, education ought to be. But let's appeal to the basic science of learning to design these smart contexts where you can get the most out of people as well. Um, I would like to ask uh, to add something to this smart context because I'm from the city of Zurich and looking not into university and looking like from kind of an outside perspective, I think this is a very important point. Um, a smart context should also be an alternative. That's what you said, Sarah Springman, before with the public school and taking kids at the age of eight and, and just intro introducing them. It's a task of society because it's something public school has to do. But it's also um, like offering an alternative because university, universities cannot be the only ones who need to solve this problem. And listening to all of you, I think it's always the challenge to university. It is. But um, it, there should be also like kind of in Switzerland, we have this Sekundarschule, Berufsmatus, like some way um, to get an education beside universities. And I think it would be very important to think more about also alternative paths not just for young, for young kids, but also re for uh, people who need to be reskilled for their whole lifetime. And not only also above the age of 44, <laughs> they still should be able to learn something. And not only people who have been into university and then into practice and then go back to university, but also people who have maybe have never been to universities. Um. Uh, at NUS, I always find it very unsatisfactory, you know, the way we actually recruit uh, students. <clears throat> and the key problem is the scale. I have 30,000 applications and I have to choose 7,000. Mm. All right. Um, but in some disciplines like medicine, we are able to do more. Right? And in our system, we just have a six weeks span. You have, they apply, you have to give the outcome. Right. But medicine, they were able to uh, shortlist 900 students and they put them through you know, uh, one and a half days of, well, you can call that tests or, you know, or exercises in which they evaluate the leadership, initiative, teamwork, and so on and so forth. And then they make a more sort of informed decision all right, without looking at their academic results. Right now, a lot of admission is based on academic results. Mm. And uh, that's what our DPM term it as academic meritocracy, right? Uh, one, one of the things that we learned actually a lot, uh, especially in medicine, is from Christian Medical College, right, in India. That one is one of the top medical colleges. Uh, they admit 100 students per year, right? But they pick and shortlist about four, five hundred students and put them on a six-month trial. Mm -hmm. And during that six months, they observe the student and they pick the That's best fair. 100. Because I opened asking industry about where universities are falling short, I'd like to end by asking universities where industry is falling short. Um, and Carol, I'd like to start out with you. Well, I, I, I know there are some people in industry that are thinking this way, but one of the things that... I, I think we have to change is, you know, industry is changing so quickly um, that industry will often lay off a large portion of its workforce to hire another set of workers with different training rather than thinking about how do you construct um, uh, uh, training or reskilling programs within the industry itself that enable um, workers to uh, um, move um, on to different careers that are more necessary for the current state of the industry. So I think, you know, um, uh, more of a commitment to um, the career trajectory of workers through education and training in the workplace is an important way for industry to develop. So this is, I think, quite country specific. So when I see how things work, for example, uh, the whole system that Waterloo has built up over you know, many, many decades, it's highly engaged with industry in a way where I wouldn't even know how to get started with that. In a <laughs> uh, 
the idea uh, of an Australian industry of uh, doing, you know, really anything other than the bare minimum uh, is, is a problem. And the whole notion like in Switzerland where you will continually work with industry to do joint professorships and stuff, that just does not occur at any scale uh, in Australia. It's not mm -hmm. seen. It's very much a, that is the government's role. Your job is to educate and train, and we take them. And, mm. you know, so if you have a conversation, uh, let's say, well, let's do some work integrated learning, they would say, okay, how much are you going to pay for us to do this? And, you know, it's like, no, but you're, well, anyway. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really interesting conversation. <laughs> it's just not very easy uh, compared to some of the other places. And uh, the reality is it's that way because Australian industry uh, hasn't needed to do that because they're making good profits without doing it. Um, and Switzerland is a landlocked country without huge amounts of iron ore and coal and uranium and everything else has actually had to create capital uh, on the human side rather than just out of the, the land. So, uh, yeah, high interaction in places where it's not occurring. Great. Um, Thanks very much for that, everyone. Um, I'm going to hand over to Chris Lubkeman now to um, just do a final wrap-up of, of some of the more uh, salient points that have come up in our discussion. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to try. <laughs> so um, my name is Chris Lubkeman. I'm an Arab Fellow and Director for Global Foresight Research and Innovation. And I'm a recovering academic. I was in, taught in different parts of the world, Hong Kong, United States, two institutions here in Switzerland have lectured everywhere. So it's really interesting to me to hear you talk, and I'm going to say the first thing is context, context, context. What's the cultural context and within which we're working, which we're educating, and the cultural context where the students are coming from and their expectations. It's a mutual contextual uh, dependency. The second was we talked quite a, little, quite a lot about the difference between training and education. And I don't think we really touched on that enough, frankly, is what's the role of higher education and all of its manifestations to train versus educate? And I think to be really open and honest about that within the context is critical. I was quite curious to hear, which I hadn't heard about before, the massification of higher education and the impact that has on what we collectively as a group are mandated to execute. And I think that's quite, that was quite fascinating. Um, three more. Learning ecosystems came up. How does this group fit within the entire ecosystem of learning within our context? Whether it's the two-year degree, the pre-degree, high school, post-grad, lifelong learning. What is that learning ecosystem today and what's it going to evolve into as we're trying to understand the talent that we need so that they're, as you said, ready for today and prepared for tomorrow. And that was kind of, kind of interesting. Then, um, uh, Manu, when you said knowledge divorced from doing is dangerous, mm -hmm. I really wanted to hear you talk more about that to really try to understand that, especially with the concept of the smart context. And what does this mean for us to create the smart context as we're looking to evolve this talent and to find the talent which we need to make the world the place that we're all hoping it's going to evolve into. So that was just some of the, the things that I, I'm, I'm hearing and I'm really looking forward very, very much to September when all of us are going to be coming back together to really dig into these topics and much, much more and look forward to seeing all of you again then. And um, I'm going to hand it back to to Sarah. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much. We've covered some really interesting ground here and lots more food for thought for us to really dig into um, in Zurich at the World Academic Summit. So we hope to see you all there in September, and thanks very much for coming. <laughs>